The Ease of Control Part 5 Welcome. I'm H.G. Tudor continuing to convey to you aspects about the ease of control surrounding death and the fear of dying and the associated views that are in relation to that. Death is a natural phenomenon. It's inherent to the human condition and it is an inevitable consequence of life. Nevertheless, death or its proximity generates a fascinating series of emotional responses, including frustration, fear, anxiety and depression. It's clear to me from my observations that society has actually adapted poorly to death, evolving from attitudes of acceptance and coping towards an aura of taboo regarding the subject. In the framework of a Western model of medical attention, Death is actually considered a failure, and therefore there is a social tendency to hide and medicalise it. To me, I am interested in the attitudes towards death, the emotions in relation to death, the fear that is associated with it, the responses, to enable me to understand what goes on with people so that I can better utilise that in order to ease my control of them. It's evident, of course, and this was confirmed by Ernest Becker, that humans, like other living beings, have a strong instinct to survive and prolong their lives. But unlike other organisms, humans are aware of the inevitability of death. It's clear that consciousness of the finitude of life evokes anxiety and terror, emotions that of course can be exploited, but also that under certain circumstances they trigger a series of avoidance mechanism. On the one hand, proximal defences are activated when thoughts of death come to the forefront of consciousness. Such defences are based on distraction or trivialization aimed at driving away such thoughts from the mind. In essence, as the spectre of death looms, the simple way to deal with it is to be distracted and not think about it any longer. Distal defences, on the other hand, prevent the thoughts of death that are still accessible from remaining in the subconscious. Two main distal defences are self-esteem and the belief in the validity of one's own cultural outlook on the world and its associated values. Those distal defences are often not available to the types of victims that we hunt down because many of the individuals are selected primarily as a consequence of the issues that they have with their self-esteem and that they automatically, through self-flagellation, end up invalidating their own cultural outlook. Thus, this strips them of two potential distal defences, meaning that they are more prone to consider death, fear death, and thus provide us with a greater opportunity to exploit this. Ordinarily, those mechanisms where they exist aid people in overcoming the terror associated with their own death by providing a sense of order and replacing the reality of existential death with a possible later life, whether literal or symbolic. The fact is that it's so important to understand what people's reactions to death might be. And therefore, I studied a variety of reactions and emotions aroused by thoughts about a person's own death to better understand them. The survey asked briefly describe the emotions aroused by the thought of your own death. It focused on the emotions aroused by the thought of one's own death and specific thoughts aroused on the contemplation of one's own death. The results were most interesting. Among the most frequently described emotions were fear, 20%, pain, 15.6%, anguish, 
13.2%, sadness, 10%, anxiety, 10%, loneliness, 6.8%, and uncertainty, 6.5%. Fear was the emotion most often mentioned in all the conditions analysed, except when it came to those people who had professional experience in the care of dying patients, i.e. medical staff. But knowing those emotions that are associated when people think about their own mortality gives one the opportunity to either exploit it by capitalising those fears and reinforcing them, or for the utilisation of cognitive empathy for the purposes of saying, I understand that you're frightened by your death and offering false compassion to take that away by perhaps mirroring that belief in some kind of symbolic immortality, mirroring that individual's beliefs vis-a-vis -vis religion, recognising the anguish that they have and looking to ease it. All done in a benign way, of course, but still a manipulation. There are no real distinctions between those emotions cited by men and women, although women did tend to refer frequently to sadness and anguish, while men place greater emphasis on anxiety and loneliness. Some of the observations that arose from it, that many felt that they, when they were asked about the emotions aroused by the thought of their own death, they referred to five main areas, family, uncertainty about death, achieving one's goals, finitude, and the acceptance of death. With regard to family, there was a feeling of sadness at leaving their family or not being able to see them anymore. I found that quite fascinating. The ideas were stated such as, the idea of no longer being with my loved ones makes me unhappy. I find that extraordinary. There's also expression of concern about how they would cope with death or about the suffering of their loved ones during this particular time. I, would f I fear the suffering of my family and close friends. If I knew they wouldn't suffer, the thought of dying wouldn't be so bad. A typical empathic response, the concern for others. With regard to uncertainty about death, was doubts present in one's belief? Fear of not knowing what there is after death. Well, I can help you with that. There isn't anything. Thinking about my own death distresses me because doubts keep going round and round my head. What will it be like? What will be there? Or is there anything at all after death? Again, that uncertainty provides an opportunity for exploitation to control people by causing them to believe there will be something there afterwards. There is another world to which you go, particularly advantageous with those with the susceptibility to religion. But it was clear to me that from those that I have been with at the point of their own death, of which there have been numerous, many call out for God, and many call out for their mothers. They call out for God because even if they have not led a religious life, at that point where the inevitability of their death arises, they place faith, often misplaced of course, in there being something that will either save them from their death or that they will be taken somewhere beyond their death and that they will live on in some way. In the same way it was said that there were no atheists in the trenches, the fact is that at that point of the conceiving that death is inevitable, there is this distress of wondering what will it feel like and what is beyond. And therefore, with those that concern themselves with regard to the possibility of dying and those where it is coming closer and closer, there is a particular opportunity for exploitation. Those that are involved, of course, in risky professions may well try and put death beyond their minds, but it is clear from those that I have interacted with and surveyed that it does loom that they have the concern about fear, about the anger associated with suffering. 
There is a sense of anguish provoked by ignorance of the experience of death, by not knowing what will happen or when or how somebody will die. Many then recognised that they were afraid of the actual process of death, not just with regard to physical or emotional suffering, but the conditions in which their death would take place. For instance, it was said, the only thing that worries me is the pain that I may suffer or immobility or being in a coma before my death. Others stated, I'm not afraid of death, but of dying. I don't want to suffer or die alone. I don't mind dying if my loved ones are with me at the time. One picked up on that, the concept of dying alone. Everybody dies alone. Nobody comes with you. Although, of course, there may be people around you at that point. And it was interesting to learn about how people want to have people around them. They fear that moment of death on their own. It's particularly advantageous with regard to the manipulation of certain people to suggest that they would die alone, that they would die alone unless they did what I wanted them to do, that I would see to it that they would be isolated, ostracised, the proverbial Bridget Jones' fear of being found half-eaten by an Alsatian several days later. Another said, not knowing when I'm going to die is disquieting. One's tempted to say, well, I could help you with that. Other concerns revolved around leaving everything undone to ensure that things had been addressed, that ambitions had been carried out. There was the importance of achieving lifetime goals and of living all of the experiences they wished to enjoy before death. In other words, they didn't want any loose ends. They stated, my death worries me when I think about everything I'd like to do before I die. My death or thinking about it makes me wonder, when it happens, will I have achieved all my goals? Again, one can utilise that information most advantageously by whispering to someone's ear, imagine that you go without having done this or done that. Now is the time. Carpe diem. It can also be used to induce that anguish and control that person by causing them to perhaps engage in something that they might not ordinarily do. Imagine, I whisper, imagine dying and being unfulfilled, all of these opportunities that I'm placing in front of you and you haven't taken them just because you're a little bit worried about what it will feel like. Embrace it. You don't want to be on your deathbed thinking, if only I'd done what HG wanted me to do. Others noted that it was important for them to make the most of life. They stated, the thought of my death makes me happy for the time I've had to live. I enjoy life and I'm not obsessed about death. You're here to take advantage of what life has to offer. Again, a more positive attitude in that regard is something that could be harnessed, knowing that that person is possibly more up for certain things, more amenable to being persuaded to do them because they perhaps approach a more hedonistic approach to life. This data that's obtained, and there's more to discuss in part six, of why people have these views and what they are in relation to death is so very, very useful to one such as I. And I shall continue with part six with an examination of further attitudes towards a person's own death and the emotions associated with it and how it has helped me with the ease of control. Join me there.